Hey, if you have your Bibles, turn to Genesis chapter 32, 24 through 28. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I thank you so much for your presence here this morning. Yes, God, you do have a purpose. You do have a plan. I believe that we are destined for your greatness, Lord. God, not as man defines greatness, but God, in terms of your kingdom. So, Father, I pray for your grace and mercy that makes preaching effective. God, I need you, Lord. I need the mind of God, the mind of Christ. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overcome him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. The man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Amen. I want to talk to you this morning about your destiny. I want to talk to you this morning about your destiny. And I believe, as I stated in, in, in that prayer, that you are indeed destined for greatness. And I want to talk to somebody this morning who is destined for greatness, yet you have not recognized your position because you are preoccupied with your problem, with your past, with a label, with failure, and even a nickname. But before we're done here this morning, it's my prayer and hope that you no longer realize that you're destined for greatness, but you are destined for God's big time greatness. Now, as we look into the word of God, we understand that God is a covenant keeping God. Say the word covenant with me. Covenant. What is covenant? Well, covenant is, is, is simply the biblical terminology that reflects and defines the word contract. It has nothing to do with feeling, nothing to do with personality, but it has everything to do with legality. Now, over and over in the Word of God, you will hear the expression, to wit. To wit, God in Christ Jesus reconciled the world to himself. To wit is a legal term, implying that God is a God of contract. That God is a God of contract. He's a covenant-keeping God. Whenever you have a contract and there's a dispute... I've had some contracts, and I've had some disputes. <laughs> it doesn't matter what the disputes are, because you have to refer back to the contract to determine the validity of it. Let me give you a good example. In 1977, we had just pulverized the sorry, lowly Los Angeles Rams. <laughs> and we were fitted and primed and ready for Super Bowl XI. If you can just imagine the state of that Minnesota Viking locker room. Ah, the coaches were happy. Ah, the players were happy. The owners were happy. This was our fourth Super Bowl. And the first 11 Super Bowls, the Minnesota Vikings went to four of them, more than any other team in the NFL. Of course, we lost all four, but anyway. <laughs> anyway, we were excited about the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 11. Well, because everybody seemed to be in a... A, a euphoric bliss, I approached my agent if he could approach the Vikings to see if I could get a little more cash, money, money, money. <laughs> All right? <laughs> I was only making $42,000. So the Vikings responded very quickly to the request from my agent. And the response was like this, can your boy read? My agent said, of course Joe Jackson can read. He has a degree in English. He can read. Well, great, if he can read, he will understand that he has signed a legal document that we, the Minnesota Vikings, it is not our practice, it is not our position, it is not our policy to tear up and renegotiate contracts. And you know what I learned? I learned that a lesson, that's why a Christian, you'll be absolutely defeated unless you approach God from the vehicle of a covenant relationship with God. That's right. That's good. Wow. Now, over and over in the Old Testament, 
You hear them praying to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, simply saying that through these three patriarchs, they have sort of become the umbilical cord that attaches Israel or them to this covenant relationship with God. Now, when we consider uh, the God of Abraham and Isaac, we recognize Abraham that he had some struggles himself. Oh, yeah. We recognize that he had indeed struggles in his character. We recognize the difference between calling and character. We recognize the difference between ideals and reality. We recognize the difference in Genesis 12, where God spoke to Abram, and Genesis 22, where God spoke to Abraham and said, go sacrifice your son that you love. We recognize the difference also in having a great name and being a great man. Overall, indeed, Abraham was a great man. He's booked in three religions in the world. And we can see why he has earned this meritorious title of patriarch of the faith. And when we look at his son Isaac, we can see, as we, rather, we can see a similar uh, thread and character. In spite of the fact that Isaac inherited some of the flaws of his father, but in spite of that, he was a blessed man. He was a godly man. He was a man that moved in the supernatural. He was a man that God used to redig the wells of his father. Let me give you an example. Um, in the fourth grade, I had a teacher named Miss Webb. I grew up in Cincinnati. I'm a Buckeye all the way. I grew up in Cincinnati. And we had a teacher in the fourth grade named Miss Webb. Miss Webb was mean. <laughs> she was probably from Maricopa. <laughs> and uh, she gave us this type of assignment. And, she's, and you've heard this before. She said, class... Here's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a picture. And I want you to circle the item in the picture that does not belong in the picture. In other words, it'd be a picture perhaps of a living room, family room. Uh, you, you know, you find a, a flat screen TV perhaps, a um, sofa, love seat, a chair, lamp, refrigerator. Well, in most of our homes, you won't find a refrigerator in the living room. So you circle refrigerator. If I were to ask you to draw a picture of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, and then circle the, uh, the person in the picture that does not belong in the picture, who would it be? It'd be Jacob. You see, Jacob was a proverbial black sheep. Oh, yeah. He, he, he was the least likeliest one to succeed. He was vicious. He was robust. He was um, riotous. He had his own carnal dispositions. Yet in spite of all those adjectives, uh, Jacob was elevated to the high and lofty position in which God prayed that Israel <laughs> might be in contact with God. What is God trying to show us here? I believe that God is trying to show us is that, or what he is trying to show us is that whatever it takes or requires a person to be selected and used of God, it has nothing to do with your good looks or your goodness, or even your skill set. Oh, yeah. Because God, to me, sometimes picks the most unlikeliest critters on the face of the earth. And I suppose if we live long enough, we'll come to the conclusion, God, that yes, you're right. It's not by might. It's, it's, it's not by power. But it is indeed by the Spirit of the living God, right. that he is indeed the God of Jacob. Right. You see, because of the magnitude I believe of God wants to do in your life, the enemy has set most of us up, if not all of us up, from Jump Street, so that you would not fulfill your destiny. You know, Jacob's struggle did not begin in his youth, in his childhood, or when he was a toddler or even an infant. That boy was in a fight in the womb right. even before he got here. That's right. That's right. And some of you, you were in a fight before you got here. Oh, yeah. Figuratively and literally. You weren't born in a peaceful, calm environment. You didn't come out of a Mayberry, leave it the beaver <laughs> type of community, Aunt B, Gomer Pyle. Some of you came out of the furnace of affliction, didn't you? Some of you, uh, you came out of the white hot heat of a struggle, didn't you? 
Some of you were born on the wrong side of the track. You were born in the wrong neighborhood, the wrong time, the wrong, the wrong street, the wrong avenue, the wrong house, the wrong color. Hold on a minute, Big Joe. Didn't know you were going to play that card. <laughs> I got news for you. I don't play cards. But even growing up in a northern industrial city like Cincinnati, there are certain things that I wasn't allowed to participate in. And that was going to Coney Island in Cincinnati. We couldn't even go on the grounds until 1955. And we couldn't swim in the largest recreational pool in America until 1961. I put my little 35 cent down on the counter. A little white girl told me, we don't take Negroes. So I don't take them either. I just want to go swimming. <laughs> if I heard this once, if you're white, you're right. If you're brown, stay around. If you're black, get back. But you know the sad thing about that statement? I never heard it once from a white man but from my own people. My own people, my own daddy, my own mama. Don't get comfortable, folks. The devil is trying to keep us all on the back of the bus right. yeah. with the thought that our present condition, our circumstances, would be the essence of our identity. And Jacob was in a fight in his mother's womb even before he got started with Esau, which was, which, which was incidentally the first biblical record of a woman who carried twins. And Rebecca, his mama, asked a very significant question. And the question simply is this, why am I thus? Why am I thus? You see, there are two different nations warring inside of you. And you see, some, somewhere in the Thors of your existence, you're going to find two different people living inside your house. And you're going to wonder, God, why am I thus? Why does my light replicate Romans 7? Let me tell you, God has a plan. See, there's a battle for your soul, but God has a plan for your life. In spite of the fact that the enemy, he wants to assassinate, he wants to annihilate and he wants to destroy you. God has a plan for your life. 40, 44 years ago, 46 years ago, I was 18. I was walking home from football practice, doing my thing. I was on the College of New Mexico State in Las Cruces. And a kid named Ken Johnson approaches me. He said, hey, big man, have you got five minutes? I said, well, what's the deal? And he told me that God loved me. He used a little track called the Four Spiritual Laws. And led me to the Lord right on the campus of New Mexico State, 18-year-old freshman at the height of the Jesus movement. Oh, yeah. He said that God had a plan for my life. God had a purpose. We've been talking about that this morning. God has a purpose. God has a plan. There's somebody here. You need to know that this morning. There's somebody in this room this morning. You need to realize and not only know it. But you need to understand that God has a plan for your life. The devil has come to do three things. He's come to steal, he's come to kill, and he's come to destroy. That's right. That's right. But God has a plan. That's right. Now, just because God has a plan for your life, that doesn't mean that you're not going to face a struggle right. and adversity. In the NFL, I learned that there's no easy, well, in high school, it seemed like there was an easy path to the quarterback. In college, it was a little tougher, but it was still easy because I had speed. For my size, I could just run. This is just a God thing. And I come off that edge, boom. Second in sacks, my rookie year as a rookie. <laughs> but there's no easy path to a quarterback in the NFL. It's always, it's always hard. It's always a journey. It's always a fight. And Jacob was destined to be used of God in spite of his struggles, in spite of the fact that, of, or, or rather, in spite of his weakness and carnality, he was able to receive a birthright that his calling and his character was really not prepared to walk in. 
And there he is holding this birthright that it received through trickery. Even though God had already established that the blessing would come through Jacob. But Rebecca, she tried to just tilt the scales so it would surely come through Jacob. Maybe someone in here, you acquired something through a theft. You stole it. And I remember once, I stole this guy's watch. I was a thief, man. I was just a miserable, stole my dad's 61 Comet, Mercury Comet, stole that. Stole Mr. Peak's 54 Chevrolet, stole that. And I stole this uh, watch. And you know, nobody ever saw me steal it, but obviously I stole it. And even though I got away Scott clean, I couldn't really actually enjoy that watch. Because I got it through trickery, I got it through a, by, by stealing it. And unless your conscience is absolutely purely seared, you can't enjoy things unless you earn it. Unless you got some dirt underneath your fingernails. You broke some fingernails. You threw out your back in pursuit of a dream and a vision. And Jacob received a birthright that he was not prepared for. Jacob, literally, trickster, schemer, con artist, and scammer. Unfortunately, those terms aren't isolated to institutions and jails. We might have a schemer in the house this morning. Oh, yeah. We may have a schemer in the house this morning. I remember, man, I was like 12 years. I grew up in the Baptist church, Black Baptist church. And we had a pastor named William D. Mosley. Man, that guy could preach. Woo! You know, I tried to preach like him. The singing, you know, at the end of your service, you get, you get the preaching. Mm -hmm. God said that he would come down. And I believe. And I practiced on a tape recorder years ago. <laughs> and I had it down, man. This was when I was living in Minnesota. And I, and, and I had a service in your home state, Wisconsin. I started doing, those white folks thought I was crazy. <laughs> But Reverend Mosley could do it, and I was 12 years old, and he said, who wants to come down and join the church? I said, yeah, I do. I was 12 years old, so I came down, and two things happened to me. They put my name on the uh, church directory, Joy Jackson, a member of Trinity Baptist Church, and they baptized me. I mean, they immersed me, man. I was under for about 10 seconds. They pulled me back. <laughs> Wanted to make sure they really got me. <laughs> so... You, you've heard the story. You go down a dry devil, and you come up a wet devil. Because the only thing happened to me was that I had a superficial, razor-thin veneer of Christianity applied to the surface of my life. I was lost as a ball in high weeds. Let me tell you something, though. If God's got a call upon your life, you know what he'll do? I believe that he will wrestle you down, that he might break you, that he might change you to his glory. Now, God doesn't force himself on anyone, but he creates the dynamics. So man has no excuse. He makes it as clear as black and white so that you will respond to the goodness and to love and the mercy and the salvation of Jesus Christ. And God begins to wrestle him down. You see, nobody could do anything with me. Uh, scouts, uh, Boy Scouts, they couldn't do anything with me. Sunday school teacher, they couldn't do anything with me. Uh, my parents, they couldn't do anything. Juvenile court, I was sent to juvenile court, man, for stealing cars. They caught me. I was put my hand on a Bible. I swore I'd never do it again. I got with my homeboys, stole another car. They already told me that if I did this again, I'm going to BIS, Boys Industrial School in Lancaster, Ohio. Got busted again. And by the grace of God, I'm not in three places on the streets in Cincinnati, moping around saying, what's going on, baby? What's going on? Out of my mind trying to get high. Or I could be at the Ohio State Penitentiary. Or I could be at the old Negro Cemetery dead before my time. Be not wicked over much, neither you be a fool, for why should you die before you... You know people now, 
that should be sitting right next to you, but they're gone. They died young. They died making stupid decisions and choices. But see, God, we're told, wrestled Jacob down until the breaking of the day. Why until the breaking of the day? Because for you, time, we're, I mean, that's what we have, a vacuum of time. 80 years, 100 years, and it's time sensitive. Now, my father was, did not come to Christ until the end of his life. My father loved Joe Namath. And uh, growing up in Cincinnati, we're playing the Bengals at Riverfront Stadium in Cincinnati. And my father always wanted to meet Joe Willie, Joe Namath. He loved those white shoes. He loved the guarantee that he, he did for Super Bowl III. I guarantee you we're going to win the game. So my father asked me um, if he could take a picture with Joe Namath on Saturday before we play the game on Sunday. Uh, you can have family members on the field. Uh, you can have uh, friends on the field. And, and, and my dad was on the field, and he said, can I have a picture with Joe Willie Namath? I said, Dad, of course. As a matter of fact, we have a, a picture of that somewhere. If you could, um, and um, yeah, there's my, there's, there's me. Uh, there's uh, my dad with my Aggie jacket on, New Mexico State. My aunt and Joe Namath. We took the picture, uh, played the game, flew back to New York City. I get a call maybe uh, two weeks later from my brother at 1 a.m. in the morning. He said, Dad had a heart attack. I said, well, how's he doing? He said, well, he's dead. I said, what? He's only 57 years old. I just saw him two weeks ago. I don't even have that picture developed yet. That's when you have to take him to a pharmacy. <laughs> you know, it's not instantaneously. You take him to a pharmacy, you get a, a roll of film, and they call you, and your stuff is ready in, I don't know, seven days or so. I said, oh, my goodness, my father's 57. He's dead. He's only, you know, I mean, he was my biggest fan. He never missed a game. How this thing happened? But more importantly, my father was not ready to meet God. His heart was not ready to meet God. And I came back to the funeral. My grandmother said, Joe, I need to tell you something. I said, Mom, I know, you know, he's obviously dead. Now, my grandma just lost her only child. And she said, no, 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 that's not what I want to tell you. Your father went to church on Sunday. My dad was a, a mailman. He carried the mail all throughout the city of Cincinnati. And he went to church on Sunday. Reverend Mosley preached a message. He responded to the message, gave his heart to Christ, went to work the very next day on Monday, dropped dead. God has to get you to a particular place in a certain amount of time. And the Bible says that when the angel saw that the day was breaking, he became more radical. Because maybe you've been so stubborn. And maybe for some of you, this is this moment right now. This is your moment right now. You'd be better not to come to church, hear the gospel, hear the glorious good news of Jesus Christ, and then walk out of here as if it was just If it was just a political convention. You see, God sees that some of your time is running out. Franklin Graham said uh, the other day at the funeral, he said, Daddy, I'm going to see you. I'm going to see you one day. And it might be soon. I don't wish death on anyone. But the Bible says, it's appointed unto man to die, and after that, the judgment. We think we're going to live forever, but we're not. Right. Everybody is going to be in a box like that or, 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 or some type of funeral service. We all will because it's appointed unto man to die. And after that, the judgment. By the blood of Jesus Christ, the judgment is on Christ. Right. Not, on, not on, on you, not on me. God knows just how to hit you that you might respond, yes. I don't care how tough you are. 
I don't care how strong you are. I don't care how smart you are. I don't care what color your skin is. I don't care what zip code you come from, what subdivision you live in, North Scottsdale. I don't care what university you attend. I don't care your family tree, how many degrees you have, and who your daddy is. God knows where to hit you that you might surrender to his purpose. God knows how to bring you into his presence that you might seek his face, that you might find the answers that you're seeking. When I was in college, the big thing was, who I am? Who am I? Who am I? Why am I here? What is my purpose? Well, that question, those questions are relative today. Some of you are struggling with, what is my purpose, God? I mean, what is my purpose? And God asked Jacob, what is your name? He said, my name is Jacob. I am what they call me. Trickster, con man. You see, Jacob thought he was what the people called him. You, know, you need to be careful of whom you let name you. You know, there's so many things associated with football in my life. My dad, I'm coming home from football practice. Here's another football thing. I'm in the 10th grade. And this is my first year of two-day practice. You see, back then, high school was 10 through 12. Junior high, something called junior high, was, was, was like seven through nine. So I'm in the 10th grade. This, this, this is like big time. I'm in high school, baby. And I'm about 6'5", uh, 250. And I'm a 10th grader. So we're playing two-a-day, or rather we're having two-a-day practices, and I wasn't driving. So we stay at the high school all day. The practice is early, you get a ride, you know, get your folks to drop you off, but I couldn't come home for lunch. So we would either bring our lunch or go somewhere and eat. Well, there was a convenience store that all the football players, they would just go in, and they wouldn't buy food, but they would just rifle the place. They'd steal everything. And I wanted to be just like those guys. And so I stole something too. I tell you, I was a thief. And when, I, when we got out, we were in this circle, and we were comparing, what you get? I got some wine. What you get? I got some cigarettes. What you get? I got this. I got that. Joey, what you get? I got a bag of Oreo cookies. <laughs> what? So they gave me the nickname of Cookie. 44, 50 years later, I go home today in Cincinnati, and my friends will call me Cookie. My mother today doesn't know the truth. She thinks it's because I love her Tall House chocolate chip cookies with <laughs> walnuts, which I do. But mother would say, Cook, I got some cookies for you. I said, thanks, Mom. I'm like, man, Mom is 96 years old. I'm not going to say, hey, well, you know, Mama. No. But be careful of whom you let name you. One sensation, rather one situation, one event, one act doesn't determine who you are. Right. Failure is not failure, nor is it final unless you don't learn from it. That's right. Jacob reflected the opinion of the people around him. Right. Never, ever, ever allow opinions of others to reflect and define your truth. I have a Super Bowl ring. I don't have it with me being fixed but that ring is, is this is my real Super Bowl ring I tell people that my wedding ring this is my real Super Bowl ring I won that one <laughs> so anyway what's that you want to preach go ahead I'll give you a mic if you want to anyway um, I was in California and the, and, the, and the ring was appraised at $15,000 he took one of those loops and he looked at it. I went somewhere else, they said 65. I went somewhere else, they said 4,500. I called Justin's, who manufactured high school rings, championship rings, class rings, Super Bowl rings. I said, what's the value of the ring that we were given for Super Bowl 11? I said, Mr. Jackson, let me put you on hold. They, uh, they came back, $2,200. $15,000, I'm not a math major, English major, but I know that's a variance of almost, what, $13,000? I wonder why the difference. Well, the difference was determined by whom you ask. 
And that's called subjective value. Because everybody's got an opinion about you. Some people think you're cute. Some people think you're not. But your value is not determined good or bad by what I think because it's intrinsic. Amen. Because you have been made in an incredible image of the Father. And Jacob was a con man. He was a racketeer. He was a trickster. But you cannot allow what you've done to find who you are. And many of us, some of you perhaps, you spend the rest of your life you're trying to find someone to name you. And many times, you brothers will go from woman to woman. You sisters will go from man to man, drug to drug, drink to drink, bed to bed, trying to find somebody to name me. God says, your name is Israel. I am who I am, not because of people, failures. You can call me cookie, looky, bookie, or wookie. I don't care. <laughs> God says, I know exactly who you are. Right. You are Israel. You're destined for God's greatness. You've got a dream. You've got a vision. And maybe you think from where you are uh, compared to where you need to be, you think, God, the vision looks crazy. Remember, man is sensual and God is spiritual. And sometimes when you talk to God, who is indeed spiritual, what God says seems to be crazy. Doesn't make sense. Ridiculous. You might have come, come through a divorce. You may have come through a bankruptcy. You may have come uh, out of prison, foreclosure. You're gonna see that God is not man, that he should lie. If God said it, he's gonna bring it to pass. And at this point, Jacob begins to exemplify the unique trauma that is transferred to a soul who has had a God encounter. You see, in the spirit, you have one name, and the flesh is something else. Let me just close up here. And in closing, I just want to talk to some of the real people. I don't want to talk to the self-righteous. I don't want to talk to Deacon Flip Flap. I don't want to talk to Big Mama Divine. I want to say sometimes some of us are distracted by trying to kill our Jacob. Because we think God will never use me. When in reality, from the first moment that Jacob had his first encounter with God until he drew his last breath, you'll see both names showing up referred to the same person. Both guys keep showing up. Now, the scripture that we read said your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. Yet throughout all the scripture, you rarely, in this, in, this, um, in this sentence, you rarely hear him refer to the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Israel. He is forever called the God of Jacob. I was just gripped by Billy Graham's funeral. And um, his children shared the story of what daddy meant to them. And his one daughter, Ruth, was especially, uh, I, was, I was especially moved by her, her testimony. She was married for 21 years. This is Billy Graham's daughter. And then after 21 years of marriage, for some reason, she got divorced. Her family told her, Ruth, I think the best thing for you is to get far away from this situation as you can. So she moved to be closer to her older sister, who invited her to attend her church. Well, the pastor introduced Ruth to a handsome widower. You may have heard the story. And they began to date. And her family and friends cautioned her, you're moving way too fast. You just came out of a 21-year marriage. You just came out of divorce. Take your time. Her mom called her from Seattle. Slow down, baby. Her dad called her from Tokyo. Have some prayer about this. Wait, wait, wait till you get to know him. But she says, what do they know about a single person who's been divorced? I mean, I have rights. I have needs. And I'm going to get married to him. So on, on New Year's Eve, they got married. And in 24 hours, she knew that was the wrong person. I messed up. 
I messed up. And five weeks into that marriage, she bolted. She's thinking, what am I going to tell daddy? I mean, it's just not like your father. This is Billy Graham. What am I going to tell daddy? I've blown it again. I mean, I'm embarrassed. What do people think about me? Billy Graham's daughter is, 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 is bringing judgment on, on, on the ministry and all these things. And she's driving two days back to North Carolina. She gets to the house, comes up the driveway, and who's at the end of the driveway with arms wide open? It's her daddy. It's Billy Graham. It's Jacob. The Bible says they cried upon Israel. The next verse will read, Jacob spoke and said. Billy Graham knew the love of God. And those kids said Billy Graham was no different in front of millions of people than he was in the home. He loved me as Jacob. That was my condition. But he loved me because of my position. Israel. The next text will read, Jacob spoke and said, and we read, Jacob was old and about to die, but Israel rose and strengthened himself. How about you this morning? Where are you at on the road? Are you Jacob? Are you Israel? Are you work in progress? Every knee is going to have to bow. Every tongue is going to have to, have to confess that Jesus is Lord. I gave my life to the Lord years ago. He changed my heart. Made me a brand new person. Didn't promise me wealth. Didn't promise me even a better life, but he promised me eternal life. And that's through Jesus Christ. There's only one way. It's through Jesus Christ. Don't be diffused with all the spirituality that can be anywhere from seances to Beyonce or whatever. It's only through the cr cross of Jesus Christ whereby we must be saved.